Bartha Knoppers is director of the Center of Genomics and Policy of McGill University and the Genome Quebec Innovation Center. Knoppers is a lawyer specializing in the ethical aspects of genetics, genomics, and medicine. She is a professor of human genetics in the Faculty of Medicine at McGill. She is also a member of the International Bioethics Committee of UNESCO, which drafted the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. Knoppers is an officer of the Order of Canada, an officer of the Ordre National du Québec, and in 2014 she was named a Great Montrealer by the Board of Trade of Metropolitan Montreal. My interests lie in the field of genomics writ large. I'm, I'm, I'm less in, in, in clinical ethics and more into research ethics, research integrity, and everything surrounding um, genomics. I'm a law professor, it's actually integrated or embedded, if you like, in a center, an innovation center here at McGill, where uh, my goal is to um, not only support researchers in, in an anticipatory way, um, understanding some of the eventual issues that might arise with their research, and also to support them during their research and to invent um, as well uh, ideas and policies and so on that can advance uh, science and society. So we are into protocol reading, we're into drafting of consent forms, we're drafting access policies, we're drafting biobank policies. So we're very much tied into the real life of research. We're not just sitting here either trying to invent problems or ideas. I'll give you the answer that I get asked by customs officials every time I travel through um, airports and they ask, what do you do? And I take a deep breath and I think, should I just say, I'm a law professor? And that sometimes scares them and I get through really fast. Or I actually say what I really do, which is look at um, the interaction between biotechnology and society and, and what some people might think are science fiction issues others take very seriously as necessary for human survival or progress or for the uh, fight against disease and, uh, and so on. So I try to give a short answer. N normally the fastest way is to say, have you heard about Dolly? And then everyone says, oh, the sheep, oh. And then they start about cloning or they start talking about, yes, what about genetics? That's bad, isn't it? There's all these genes and you're manipulating them, aren't you, in the laboratories? And, so sometimes it takes a while to get through customs. <laughs> if you talk to CGIP students, or younger students in particular, they right away, the first thing they say is Gattaca. And they link into the movie about how um, the more we understand, the more choices we have, the more directed those choices will be by society, whether for economic reasons or for political reasons. And so they see these choices uh, that are provided by knowledge of our genome as actually narrowing um, what will happen in the future, whereas I see it as a, a broadening of what humans can understand and actually make responsible choices. My biggest stumbling block right now is trying to mesh ethics requirements that are sometimes different locally or culturally or socially with the new way of doing science, which is international and collaborative. Because if, if everyone sets up barriers and their terrain and only their committee and only their review and only their principles, then the new way of doing science, which is sharing and open access, and um, will, will not be possible. What I would really like if maybe, let's say we're like 2050, there would be a whole generation of people who, who would see international, interdisciplinary, uh, collaborative uh, approaches to policy making and science as being normal, as being uh, um, the way to ensure that we don't um, have sort of either renegade science or um, inadequate policy simply because people don't have the courage to take on the, uh, a, a mission of this size. I aim to, to um, develop, uh, for discussion purposes, governance structures that are international in scope, that have the respect of participants of, of civil society and actually work 
um, to uh, ensure scientific integrity and the respect of participants and donors of, of tissues and data, no matter where they come from around the world, but to make sure that there is a system that is not um, so divided, like you know the, the the globes with the countries, all the little countries, and then there's a dark edge saying this is this country, and then a dark edge and another color for another country. And ethics review tends to be that it's very territorial, and everyone is sure that they have better ethics than than the next. And so I think we need to build a, a system of trust to to really um, encourage and um, support international collaboration. Well, there, there, there's cultural diversity, but I think in terms of ethics, what we would first have to do is go for the highest denominator. They're, they're, in other words, not go down to what, what would be the easiest. So take the most um, respected and highest sort of stringent, while yet workable, uh, approach to ethics review and, and start with that as our standard so that it would be difficult for people to say, well, our standards, the way we do things, is better, you know. And better does not mean having more, you know, 27-page consent forms. Better means that there's actual ongoing monitoring and oversight and accountability. And I think if that can be put into place, we can simplify the process, make it more transparent, and gain the trust of, of different countries. The biggest issue right now is the um, tsunami, if you can say that, of data. We just have so much data and genome sequencing is moving so fast, the cost is going down so quickly that no one knows how to handle it. Can you send it anywhere? anywhere? I mean, we're all talking about cloud computing, but how safe is cloud computing? And while we still have the, the trust of participants who give their data and their, their samples, you know, what's in the cloud, if that's what we use, or we use algorithms to make it easier to handle this uh, data um, size, which has gone completely um, out of control. Um, we have to also make sure that we don't lose what the participants originally asked us to do, is to make sure it was be secure and remain private. Now, if you're a really public person, you can go and put your sequence right now, today. On, on the web, there's a whole site for the Personal Genome Project where you can do this, but most people are not ready for that, putting their whole genome sequence and anyone in the world can sort of look at it and understand it, or maybe not, most of it's still indecipherable, but um, most people aren't ready for throwing everything into the public domain. So while we're waiting for that comfort zone, for that your whole genome sequence not really being that important, you're much more than your gene, and, and you're, you interact with your environment. There are socioeconomic conditions, epigenetic effects that take, that, um, take effect. Um, we have to somehow secure this environment of data deluge, if I can call it that. I think stem cells would be another another one. Um, the idea of autologous, i.e. using your own cells to sort of not ensure immortality, but sort of repair or palliate or um, whether you take skin cells to replace areas of the brain that are, that are dying, so to speak, or heart cells that have um, um, gotten a scar, scar tissue. So is the human person then sort of an auto-regenerative source for their own, not immortality, but their own quality of life? And in, in that sense, I think, um, even though I don't do death, as I usually say when people ask about euthanasia and so on, I do think the um, quality of life issue with stem cell um, technologies is really going to be an important one. I do not think adult stem cells are ultimately as good or the only solution, I think we eventually will still need to use embryonic, embryonic stem cells. Well, besides working with my colleagues uh, that I, uh, who I've been working with for 25 years, the best part is working with the people who work here. All the young um, uh, professionals who, who most of them have master's degrees are working on doctorates. And they're all in this intersection and uh, in sort of a no person's land because it's, it's necessarily interdisciplinary. 
it's anticipatory and forward-looking, sort of like doing foresight uh, um, stuff. And it and so they come into work and they have great ideas. They're very excited, and at the same time, they're on very uncertain territory because you don't fit into the disciplinary silos. You know, the faculty of this and the faculty of that, and so they have a lot of courage. I mean. Um, I like interdisciplinary stuff. I like being on the margin, and I don't mind not belonging anywhere specifically. I'm in the middle of an innovation center, a law professor, but I'm I'm professor at the Faculty of Medicine. So I think if they have the courage to to sort of take the next generation of ideas and and uh, consensus building forward, then uh, that makes me happy. I would say remain uh, uh, eternally curious. That's simple. Otherwise, you're going to be bored. Or if you like boredom, it's safe, but I wouldn't be happy.